Welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. When you're ready to transform your sales for today's transforming market, we've got you covered with your host, the queen of cold calling and founder of Salesology, award-winning author, speaker, sales trainer, and coach, Wendy Weiss. Welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. And I'm your host, Wendy Weiss. I am the founder of Salesology and the Salesology Prospecting Method. I am also known as the queen of cold calling. And uh, today, our very special guest is Sam Silverstein, who is the founder of Accountability Institute. And uh, Sam is uh, account- an accountability and leadership keynote speaker. His mission is to empower people to live accountable lives, transform the way they do business, and to thrive at extraordinary levels. I love that. Um, he works with organizations worldwide to help build powerful workplace culture and long-term sustainability. He is the founder of the Accountability Institute, which is a, uh, an organization that certifies advisors to work with leaders and organizations to build greater accountability and develop stronger leaders. Uh, he has been inducted into the Speaker's Hall of Fame. And uh, this is very impressive. He is the author of 11 books, including I Am Accountable, Non-Negotiable, and No More Excuses. So welcome, Sam Silverstein. Well, thank you, Wendy. I guess I need to bow. Is that, isn't that the proper proper thing for me as a commoner to do in front of the queen? I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, okay. you know, I want to do it right from the beginning. Okay, well, good for you. And uh, so let's begin at the beginning. Tell me the Sam Silverstein story. How how did you how did you uh, get here? How did you become the founder of the Accountability Institute and write eleven books, which I'm pretty darn impressed with? Well, thank you. And actually, um, in two weeks, it'll be twelve because the accountability the accountability advantage, which is all about workplace culture. Uh, comes out shortly. So by the time this airs, it'll be 12. Um, and I am proud of that. It's It's been a, it's been an honor and a remarkable journey. Um, you, how did I get here? Wow. You know, I, I, uh, I grew up in a family business and, and went into the family business after, after I got my MBA. So, you know, I went through the formal education route and worked in the family business, didn't really love the family business. So, I did. I did what anybody would do that was in a family, one family business. I got out of it and uh, got into the other family business. So I went from working with my parents to working with my wife's parents, which I think makes me a small business expert at this point. Certainly a family business expert. Uh, did that for a while, and people started coming up to me and thanking me for the advice that I had given them. And quite frankly, I didn't even remember having those conversations. And I thought if I could have a positive impact without trying, what would happen if I tried? And I had met Tom Hopkins, and he said that his speaking career took off when he wrote his first book. So I said, you know what? I think I'll write a book. So I wrote a book and started speaking. And um, 13 years later, realized that really everything came down to accountability, which we can talk about. That's the foundation in any life or organization for what you're trying to achieve. And 17 years later, 18 or well, seven, you know, realized that I want to create an organization that has an extremely long runway. That's when I founded the Accountability Institute and we started certifying um, other change agents, coaches, uh, consultants, trainers, speakers, how to take all this content that we had developed and how to take it to their clients so they could deliver greater value, um, grow their business and help their clients be more successful. Hey, um, you know, I was looking at your website and I was I was struck uh, by something you said on your website, which is that everything that we were taught about accountability is completely wrong. And uh, so I thought that would be a good place to start. What exactly is accountability then? Well, you know, the accountability is keeping your commitments to people. That's the definition of accountability that we go with. 
the challenge is that a lot of people see accountability as punitive. They see it as punishment. They see it as I'm going to hold you accountable, which is 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 the same thing as putting a gun to someone's head. Um, leaders in so many organizations, I see they they use accountability to try and manipulate people to do more for them, and it's about what what the people are going to do for you as a leader. That's not accountability. That's poor leadership. What accountability is, is the leader being accountable first to the people and for the people. And there is a difference and creating an environment that inspires people to choose to be their very best and to be accountable. And when people in an organization choose to be their very best, when everyone in the organization chooses to be their very best, then the organization is always going to be better than in any other scenario. So it's getting leaders to see and understand accountability differently. And once they understand it differently, then what happens is they commit to their people differently, they support their people differently, and they get a different result. Wow. I wish I had met you all those years ago when I started my business Um, Because I had clients that would hire me to train their teams, and it would usually be the people that weren't doing very well. And they'd get them all in a room and they'd say to them, you're all failing. So we brought in Wendy. Here she is. (laughs) And I would think, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? See, the the challenge is, and that's, you know, that's a great story, because who wants to in, in your position or my position, that introduction, because it, nobody, want, you, basically everyone in the room just got slapped and they go, now listen to what Wendy says. Um, the reality is the person that needed the training was the individual that introduced you. Because the reason that people fail in an organization is not because of the people. The reason people fail is because of the leader. The reason that people succeed in an organization is because the leader supports them, creates an environment for success, Uh, delegates not just uh, the responsibility, but the authority and also makes sure that all the resources are there. It's everything always comes back to the leader. And so the leader can't give what the leader doesn't have. And so in that situation, that leader didn't understand what accountability really is. And they weren't able to create an environment that would help those people grow to their greatest success. Yeah. um, Could you talk a little bit more about Uh, what leaders need, because what I see a lot in the sales world, um, and I'm going to date myself here, it's the it's the Peter principle that uh, people are are promoted to their level of incompetence, meaning they do something really well, and they get promoted. And then they do uh, that job really well, and then they get promoted, and they keep getting promoted until they get to the job that they can't do very well. Lots of times, great salespeople get promoted into management, but then they don't have any training to be managers, and that's a problem. Right. So they don't do well, and they let them go. And whose fault is that? Is that that individual's fault, or is that leadership's fault? Because to me, it's always going to come back to leadership. And you know what? This look, I have a strong background in sales. Yeah, you know, I've been in sales for for a long time. My first jobs were all in sales. I've traveled on the road and sold. I've done, I've been in the trenches. And there's nothing wrong. There's it's honorable to be a great salesperson. That's what a great career. You don't have to go into leadership. You can just stay out there selling and serving people and delivering value. Now, there's also nothing wrong with wanting to to get into leadership. And I say leadership, not management, because to me, you manage things and you lead people. But in this situation, to me, so we said accountability is keeping your commitments to people. We delineate between tactical commitments, which is transactional, and relational commitments, which builds relationships. It's the relational commitments that define accountability. One of the relational commitments is a commitment to discover someone's potential and lead them to it. That's one of 10 relational commitments. And so as a leader in an organization, if, if Wendy, you're in sales and I go, wow, you know, Wendy's great in sales, but Wendy would make, Wendy would make a great team leader. Now, just because you're great in sales doesn't mean you'd make a great team leader. Um, I mean, I believe that you need to know sales, but there's other characteristics and other traits that are going to prepare you to be a great team leader. I want, 
Wendy to be a great team leader. And I come to you, Wendy, I think you would be a great team leader. And you're like, I don't know. I don't have any experience. Don't worry. We're going to train you. We're going to get you prepared. We're, you know the sales side of it. You can learn the leadership side. Let's get you, let's get you up to speed. You're going to be great. Now, if I do that with you and I lead you on to greater successes, what happens to our relationships? How do you see me? You're a rock star. Exactly. Would you want to leave me? No. Exactly. And so what happens is you create this, this relationship and you create loyalty because I'm, tr I'm working to help you be your very best and get the most out of you and have the very best life. In return, you're going to help me build this company to be its very best. And so if I'm going to promote you, why would I promote you into something that you're not good at? I would promote you into something that you are good at, or I believed you had the capability to be good at, and then I would continue to support you with the training necessary. That's what great leadership is. And if there's an opening and you're just trying to fill it with a body, well, that's not leadership. That's, I don't even know what you call that, but it's failure. Yes. So, I mean, I'm hearing you say essentially that leadership starts right up at the top. Um, does, does this apply differently to different size companies? In other no. words, an enterprise, no, well, no. we're all done. No, <laughs> no. it's, 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 it, truth is truth. If I respect you, if I value you, if, if I lead you to your potential, if I commit to the values of the organization, if I commit to stand by you when all hell breaks loose, if I commit to sound financial principles, if I commit to a good name, um, all these things are going to contribute to our relationship and is going to help build an environment of success and a community and a culture that people want to be a part of, whether that company has 20 people or 20,000 people. The only difference between a small company and a large company, it's more difficult to communicate with everyone in a large company. So when's the best time to start? Well, when you have one person, that's the best time to start. When's the next best time? Now. And you start now and you start building these lines of communication. And you start building a culture where people feel valued. And the bigger the company, the longer it may take, but there are systems and ways to do it. And if you care about it, you'll get it done. And it works the same in a large company as a small company. So what's step one? Step one is, is a leader must accept the responsibility and, and understand that they are accountable both to their people and for their people. And when you take that on as a leader, that's a heavy responsibility. But when I'm accountable to you and I'm accountable for you, and accountable for is always a higher level of accountability. It's like a stewardship relationship. You know, my, my mother passed away earlier this year. And before she passed away, she was in, a, in um, an independent living. She was 93 years old. Um, we handled all her finances, her investments, paid all her bills. You know, and so I managed her money. Now, if I lost a little of my money in the stock market, I wasn't happy, but I could not lose my mother's money. I was the steward of that money. I had to protect that money at all costs. And that was a responsibility that I took on. And when you're accountable for your people and you take on the, the stewardship relationship for their success, then you see them differently and you treat them differently. And so it starts with the leader, first of all, accepting that. And that's a heavy responsibility. It's not that the leadership isn't the corner office, the parking spot, you know, and all that. It's accepting the responsibility of the people they lead. And once that is taken on, then, then it's about defining what that culture is going to be. And you define your culture through your values. And that's where the conversation starts. So what I'm hearing is, one, there's a really big, potentially really big mind shift. Um, and then after that, a clear delineation of what the values are, which requires a whole lot of thought. Exactly. And that's why, you know, we, I say we because what, what I've developed and my team has developed over the years and now our certified accountability advisors have access to or the tools and systems to help lead leaderships and groups of people and organizations through this conversation. 
Here's the thing. Companies are great at creating values. A lot of times they come out of the marketing department. This will look good. The, <laughs> exactly. You know, that's not what values are. Values are a statement of what you believe here. This, these are the ground rules. These are the rules in the sandbox. This is how we play. And there's a very definitive way of how to create and what needs to be a part of a great value set. It's not about having great values. It has to be a great value set because if certain things aren't covered, you're going to come up short. But once those values are identified, then the question is, do they exist? Because if it's just on a piece of paper, if it's on the wall in the boardroom, and if it's on the website, and it's not being stepped out by each and every person in the organization, then those values are not the values of the organization. And so then you have a culture um, of default rather than a culture by design. Every organization has culture. It's either designed or it's by default. And you as a leader get to choose which one that is. I love this. Um, you know, sometimes uh, my clients will say to me about their salespeople, um, they don't do anything or they won't pick up the phone or they, uh, they won't use the CRM. It, it's always like they won't do fill in the blank. And so what's the shift if that's a manager's mindset, a leader's mind, a, a leader's mindset. Excellent. My job here is done. <laughs> <laughs> I made, because uh, we're doing this as audio, I made finger quotes. But uh, so if that's the uh, ostensible leader's mindset, what's well, the step back they, they need to take? So the question is, how is the culture defined? And one of the areas one of the, that the value set must attach to and define is what is excellence here? What is excellence here? And so you have a value or more than one value that's, that cl clearly delineates what excellence is in our organization. Well, this is our value. So how do we get to that level of excellence? Well, the CRM allows us to provide services that I could never provide otherwise. It allows me to have complete information. It allows multiple people. See, if, if you need service and you call and they put you on hold and transfer to you some to someone, how do you feel? You feel lousy, right? Yes. What if you don't even know me, but I've called in for service and you can go into the CRM and you can pull it up and you go, oh, here are the products that Sam's bought. Here's the backstory in his organization. Um, la da 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 da. Now you can provide that service and you can talk to me intelligently and you're not the salesperson. You're the support team that makes the salesperson look well. Well, when the leader of the sales department communicates all this information and, commun and so people understand why they're doing what they're doing, not just because it's being mandated, and they understand even most importantly, why the, how this connects to the values that we say we have as an organization, then it's very compelling to, to adopt that and do it. And at that point, if someone's not living the values, now here's the key, Wendy, if someone's not living the values and you let them stay in the organization, they're not your values. No matter how loud you shout them, no matter where you print them, if they're not being lived, they're not your values. And so when you can connect what people need to be doing to do a great job to the values, then it makes sense. Now, one other thing, and I call these the terms of change. A lot of times leaders want to change something in an organization and they say, okay, we're going to change it. We're going to do it this way. And then they move on. Here's the thing. The accountable leader always communicates, what are we changing? Why are we changing and how are we changing? And the reason they do that is because some people are what people. They just need to know what. Some people are why people. All they need to know is how. They don't need to, they don't need to know uh, uh, why. All, if they're why people, they just need to know why. And some people are how people. All they need to know is how. The how people don't even care about the why and the why don't even care about the how. If the why person knows the why, they're all in and they're on board. Now. There's another group of people that are not the what people, the why people, or the how people. And we, they always are challenging us. They're always asking questions. They're always pushing back. And what do we call them? Troublemakers. 
Now, see, why do we call them troublemakers? Because they're not jumping on board. We spent all, leadership has spent all sorts of time on this. You should just accept it and jump on board. Well, guess what? The troublemakers aren't really troublemakers. They're what, why, how people. They need the what, the why, and the how. And if we as leaders have not proactively provided that information, we haven't given them what they need to process to get on board. It's the same thing as speaking English to someone from Italy that only speaks Italian. If you can't put it in their language, they don't understand it. So leadership must proactively, and the reason I say proactively is because if people have to constantly ask questions, that's a sign that you're not respecting that it could be what, why, and how, and they start thinking we're holding something back. There's a reason they don't want us to know this. And so the accountable leader always shares that information up front, and then they're able to drive change. They're able to get sales teams and groups of people on board with initiatives. They move quicker, and they perform at a higher level. This is great stuff, Sam. Um, we're going to pause right now uh, for a word from our sponsor, but I can't wait to come back and ask you more questions. So our sponsor today is Salesology 3X Appointments. You know how frustrating and stressful it is when you leave every sales meeting wondering if your sales team knows how to sell because they're not selling and all you ever hear from them are excuses? They blame your marketing, they say you need to do more social media, and they say you need a new website. You know something's wrong, but you don't quite know what it is, and you're even starting to wonder if it's you. You don't have a lot of options. You could fire them all and start from scratch, and that would be expensive, and you're really sick of waking up in the middle of the night wondering how to fix this. Well, imagine instead that you have an easy to use replicable system that ensures that your team can easily schedule qualified appointments. And imagine that your team is excited and motivated, no more excuses, and you feel good. Salesology 3X appointments can make that happen. If you're a business owner or a sales manager with an underperforming sales team, let's talk. Click on the link to my calendar in the show notes and schedule a time. And I look forward to meeting you. And we are back with Sam Silverstein, who is the founder of the Accountability Institute. And we are talking about accountability and more importantly, leadership. So I'd like to ask you, uh, Sam, if you could give us uh, some examples, uh, maybe some before and after or uh, stories, uh, examples where Clients have just had epiphanies and everything shifted. You bet. And you bet. So one of the things that our certified accountability advisors do is, is we have a we have an online assessment tool that actually it's called the, the the culture audit and it measures accountability. It creates a number called the accountability index. And we actually look at a culture and measure accountability in an organization on the front end of an engagement because it gives us a benchmark and it also gives us a way to measure growth. And it gives us the information that we need to be able to recommend certain courses of action and developments that they need to take within their organization. And so uh, recently we had a client we worked with for a year long engagement and we saw the numbers, their numbers grew 20 to 25 percent at the end of that year across the board. It was absolutely amazing the, the growth that they had within the organization. Now, that's, you know, that's that's sort of statistical and data wise. But I'll make it even even a little bit better to understand. We had a client that uh, a gentleman, president of an organization, came up to us one time after a program that I had given, and he said, "We don't have any values. Can you help us with that?" And uh, it sounded kind of pitiful. But the reality is, they they had values. They just hadn't identified the values, codified them, and hadn't made them official. And so um, we worked through that with them to create a set of values that they loved. They started living the values. We taught them how to communicate the values, how to step them out, how to hire to the values, fire from the values, make sure they're always present. And we, we did a development with them and it was about eight months into the relationship where uh, the president of this organization was speaking at an event that, that I had been invited to speak at. And he was a, he introduced me and he said, oh, by the way, our activity level, which is what they measured in their company, 
in their organization. Our activity level has tripled since we began working with Sam and his team. Um, that is really powerful. You know, when someone shares that kind of information, when when you get the very best out of people, then your organization is going to operate at its very best. That's not rocket science, you know? It, 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 it just makes sense. You look at a sales organization, you want that sales organization to excel? Well, if everyone on the sales team is excelling, the organization as a whole excels. So how does everyone on the team excel? Well, it's going to come down to leadership at some point in time. It's always going to come back to leadership. And so what is leadership doing to create that environment where that sales team can soar? And that's always going to be the culture of the sales team and the culture of the organization. And it's that same culture that's going to produce whether or not people are inspired to be accountable. So what was the epiphany that this client had? He came to one of your programs and clearly a light bulb went off for him that he would come up to you and say, we don't have any values. Well, there's five steps to building a, a, a great organizational culture. And the first step is to define it. You define it through the values. And here was a man who lived his life by a very strong set of values. He had, he had clarity in how to live his life. And he realized that he didn't have that clarity in the business. So the epiphany was that he needed that for his business. And not just that he needed the values. And here's the key. We don't have success with every client we work with, Wendy. And what I've noticed is the difference between when we have success and we don't have success is what the leader does with what we provide them. We provide the information. We provide the techniques. We provide the training. But if the leader isn't 100% on board, then it goes nowhere. If the leader is more focused on, 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 on the bottom line than their people, then it doesn't go anywhere. And so the epiphany was for this gentleman, first of all, he was someone who got it. He, he, he valued his people. He just needed a way to, to define this culture because what happened, this was a small organization. This organization had approximately 26 people. After, he, after we helped lead the conversation around the values, they let someone go. They let the person go because they weren't living the values. And someone elected to leave because they didn't fit in the environment and they knew it. And now what happened is you had people off the team that were causing problems. They replaced them with two new people. I interviewed those two new people after they were on the job. I said, why did you come here? I love the values. That was their answer. And so they attracted two great people because of the values, not because the values are on a piece of paper, but because the values were being lived. And so the epiphany for this leader was the idea that you can, you can identify a set of values for an organization, and then you have a right to say, this is how we step it out here. And if you're not going to act this way, then you're not going to stay. And if you are going to act this way, then you're going to be celebrated. And a leader has the right and the responsibility. Because guess what? If I'm disrespecting people, and you and I report to Jane, and I disrespect you and I disrespect others and I'm, I don't speak nicely. And Jane lets me say, oh, I can't fire Sam. He's our number one producer. Well, guess what? I'm creating an environment that you don't want to be a part of and neither does anyone else. And when Jane lets me go as the sales leader, then you're like, I mean, first of all, when you fire someone, someone inevitably comes up to you that day and goes, Wendy, I, you fired Tom. What took you so long? You know, it's like they are appreciative. They realize that the leader is protecting the environment. And guess what else the sales team appreciates and understands? They said, they go, oh my gosh, she let Sam go. He was the number one salesperson. She must think we can pick up the slack. And now everyone on the team is like, oh my gosh, she believes in us. The leader believes in me. I would never want to let her down. And so now you're supporting those other people and you're growing them as well as protecting the workplace environment. I love this. And I was about to ask you for a concrete example and then you gave it to me. So Awesome. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. So I know that you have um, two gifts for our listeners. So could you uh, share your secret? Share absolutely. Your secret well, and, and, and you, you asked if we had a gift or something that we wanted to give, and we did come up with two. And, and we just like to give, 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 give. So there's two things. One, and, and I know it's all in the show notes and, and, and the links and everything to make it easy. Um, one is a personal accountability assessment. And it's, I don't know, it might take three minutes online. And, and basically, it shows how you're stepping out these 10 relational commitments that we use to define accountability. And it'll give you a report. And it's just really enlightening. And uh, I take it myself every now and then because it helps, it helps me see where I might be coming up short. So we want people to have that personal accountability assessment. And, um, and then we also have a free book, actually. And it's a free book plus shipping if you're in in the United States, and if you're not in the United States, you can get the ebook. But and it's the theory of accountability, which is the, the, my most recent book. Um, it, and we're really excited with this book. People are giving us tremendous reviews on it, and we've got a special promotion that we put together. And so it's free. You just have to pay the shipping and handling, or if you want the electronic version, there's a link for that too. Okay. And uh, yes, we are going to post both those links in the show notes. And I know that I'm going to order my copy of the book because I don't have a copy of it. And, awesome. um, and, the, and the link to order your copy will be in the show notes. So all you have to do is go and click on the link. And uh, also, I when we are finished here today, I plan on taking the accountability assessment. So again, uh, this accountability assessment, the link for that is in the show notes. So if you want to take the accountability assessment with me, click on the link in the show notes. And uh, Sam, I'll email you the results. You can you can tell awesome. me what you think. Awesome. That's great. I appreciate that. I'll be happy to look that over and have a follow-up conversation. Okay. So uh, before we finish up here today, Sam, would you put your hand over your heart and promise me that you will come back? Oh, absolutely, Wendy. I would love to come back. There's so much that we can talk about. This is a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. So please reach out to me. Let's 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 go deeper. Let's look at specific applications, whatever you want to do. Let's make it happen for the listeners of the uh, Salesology podcast. We will do that. And uh, thank you all today for listening to the Salesology Conversations with Sales Leaders podcast. And my guest, Sam Silverstein, who's the founder of the Accountability Institute. And if you found value in today's episode, please think of one business owner or one sales professional, some, somebody that you know that you think would also find value in today's episode and share that link with them. And till we meet again, I am visualizing you surrounded by cash, really large bills. You've been listening to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. Be sure to follow so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every week for more exciting insights and wisdom on transforming sales. And until next time, visualize yourself surrounded by cash, very large bills. Mm -hmm.